Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering AWS Summit 2016. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE here, live in Silicon Valley at Amazon Web Services, AWS Summit in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We, we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm here with my co-host, introducing Lisa Martin um, on theCUBE. New host, Lisa, you look great. Our first guest here is David Richards, CEO of WAN Disco. Welcome to theCUBE, great to see you. Good to see you, John, as always. So, as promised, special CUBE presentation, $20, bill here that I owe David. We played golf on Friday, my first time out in the year. He sandbagged me, he's a golfer, he's a pro, I don't play very often. There's your winnings, there you go, $20, I paid. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's been paid. Um, great fun, good to see you. It was great fun, and I'm, I'm sorry that I cheated a little bit. <laughs> Mirror in the bathroom, still running through your ears. I love the English style, they liked, it, liked all the inner game and playing music on the course, it was a great time. But we were golfing last week, we were talking, um, just kind of have a social get together, but we really talked about some things on the industry mind right now, and, and you had some interesting color around your business. We talked about your, your strategy of OEMing your core technology to IBM, and also you have other business deals. Can you share some light on your strategy at WANDISCO with your core IP and how that relates to kind of what's going on, this phenom called Amazon Web Services. They've been running the table in the enterprise now and certainly public cloud for years. $10 billion, Wikibon called that three years ago. We see that trajectory not stopping, but clearly the enterprise cloud is what they want. Do you have a deal with Amazon? Are you talking to them? And what does that impact your business? Well, I mean, the wonderful thing is if you go to AWS Marketplace, you go to their front page, we're one of the featured products on the front page of the AWS Marketplace. I think that tells you that we're pretty strategic with Amazon. We're solving a big problem for them, which is the movement of data in and out of uh, public cloud. But you asked an interesting question about our business model. So we saw, when we first came into the whole big data marketplace, we went for the, the whole direct selling thing like everybody, everybody does, but that doesn't give you a lot of operational leverage. I mean. We're in accounts with IBM right now. You mentioned OEM, our technology. At a big automotive company, they have 72 enterprise sales guys, 72. We could never get to that scale anytime soon. And they have relationships too, so it's not like they're like, you know, just knocking on doors selling used cars. They are strategic, high-end enterprise sales. Exactly, so that, that gives us a tremendous amount of operational leverage, and AWS, is one of the great stories, I think it will be one of the great IT stories of the century, to go from zero to 15 billion, if AWS was an independent company, faster than any other enterprise software company in the history of mankind is just incredible. Yeah, well enterprise, obviously, they care about hybrid cloud, which you know all about through your IBM relationship. Andy Jassy at Amazon, the CEO now of Amazon, newly announced title, he's certainly SVP, basically he's been the CEO of Amazon. He's been on record, certainly on stage and on theCUBE, saying, why do even companies need data centers? That kind of puts you out of business. You have a data center product, or is the cloud just one big data center? Will there ultimately be no cloud, no data center at all? What's your thoughts? That's a great question. We see um, the cloud as just one great big data center, or actually many great big data centers. And how you actually integrate those together, how you move data between data centers, how you arbitrage between cloud vendors. Are you really going to put all your eggs into one basket? Are you going to put everything into AWS, everything into Azure? I don't think you will. I think you'll need to move data around between those different data centers. And then how about high availability? How do you solve that problem? Well, Wandisco solves that problem as well. So a couple questions for you, David. One of the things that uh, Dr. Wood said in the keynote today was friends don't let friends build data centers. <laughs> so I wanted to get your take on that, as well as from an IBM perspective, we just talked about the OEM opportunity that you're working there to get to those large enterprises. Does that mean that you're shifting your focus for enterprise towards IBM? Where does that leave uh, Wendisco and Amazon as we see Amazon making a big push to the enterprise? So I think there was some, some big news that came out last week that was missed largely by the industry, which was the FCA, the Financial Regulatory Authority in the United Kingdom, came out and said, we see no reason why banks cannot move to cloud from a, regulated, from a regulatory perspective. That was one of the big fears that we all had, which is, are banks actually going to be able to move core infrastructure into a public cloud environment? Well, it now turns out they can. So we're all in on cloud. I mean, we can see, um, if, if you look at the partnerships that we're focused on, it's the sort of four slash five cloud vendors. It's the IBM, the AWS, uh, Azure, 
Oracle when they finally build their cloud and so on. That's, they're the key partnerships that we see in the marketplace. That will be our go-to-market strategy. That is our go-to-market strategy. So one of the things that's clear is the data value, and you do a lot of replication, so one of the things that, I forget which cube segment we've done over the years, um, that's Hurricane Sandy, I think it was, in New York City. Yeah. You guys were instrumental in keeping the uptime and availability. Yep. Um, Lisa mentioned you know, Amazon vis-a-vis -vis IBM, obviously two different strategies, kind of converging in on the same customer. Yep. Amazon's had problems with availability zones, and they're rushing and, and running like the wind to put up new data centers. They just announced a new data center in India just recently. Andy Jassy and team were out there kicking that off. So they're rushing to put points of presence, if you will, for lack of a better word, around the world. Does that fit into your availability concept? And how do customers engage with you guys with specifically that kind of architecture developing very fast? So I, th I, think, I think that's a, a really great question. And you know, th there are problems, or there have been historic problems with availability, general availability in cloud. There are lots of you know, 50 minute outages and so on that cost billions and billions of dollars. Um, we're working very closely, and I can't say too much about it, with the teams that are focused on enabling availability. I mean, clearly the IBM OEM is very focused on uh, the movement of data from a both hybrid cloud and from a data availability perspective. But there's a great deal of value in data that sits in cloud, and I think you'll see us do more and more deals around general cloud availability moving forward. Is there a specific on that front project that you can talk, share with us where you've really helped a customer gain significant advantage by working with AWS and facilitating those availability objectives, security, compliance? So one of the big use cases that we see, um, and it's kind of all happening at once really, is I've built an on-premise infrastructure to store lots and lots of data. Now I need to run compute and analytics against that data. And I'm not going to build a massive redundant infrastructure on-premise in order to do that. So I need to figure out a way to move that data in and out of cloud without interruption to service. And when we talk about large volumes of data, you simply can't move transactional data in and out of cloud using existing technology. I mean, AWS offers something called Snowball where you put it into a ruggedized drive and then you ship it to them. But that's not really streaming analytics, is it? So most of our use cases today are involved in either the migration of data from on-premise into cloud infrastructure, or the movement of data for a temporal basis so I can run compute against that data and taking advantage of the elastic compute available in cloud. They're really the two major use cases that we're, and we're working with a lot of customers right now that have that, those exact problems. So the majority of your customers are more using hybrid cloud versus all in the public cloud? Hybrid, hybrid, hybrid falls into two categories. I'm going to use hybrid in order to migrate data because I need to keep on using it while it's moving. And secondly, I need to use hybrid because I need to build a compute infrastructure that I simply can't build behind firewall. I need to build it in cloud. So the new normal is the cloud, as, as tweeted. There was a tweet here that says, database migration, now we can have an Oracle Exadata database feed that we're ready to throw into the river. <laughs> database migration is a big thing, and you mentioned that in the first question that moving in and out of the cloud is a top concern for enterprises. What, this is one of those things that's the elephant in the room, so to speak, no, no pun intended, AKA Hadoop, but moving the data around is a big deal. And, you know, you don't want to get a Roche Motel situation where you can check in and can check out. That is the lock-in that enterprise customers are afraid of with Amazon. Your thoughts there, what do you guys offer your customers? And, and if you can, give some color on this whole data-based migration issue, real, not real. So the, the big problem that the Hadoop market has had from a growth perspective is applications. And why they had a problem? Well, that, that it's the concept of data gravity. So the way that the AWS execs will look at their business, the way that the Azure execs will look at their business at Microsoft, they will look at how much data they actually have, data gravity. That's the, the implication being, if I have data, then the applications follow. And you know, the whole point of cloud is that I can build my applications on that ubiquitous infrastructure. So what we're doing, I mean, we want to be the kings of moving data around, right? So wherever the data lands is where the applications follow. If the applications follow, you have a business. If the applications don't follow, then it's probably a roach motel situation, as you so quaintly put it. But bas basically, the data is temporal. It will move back to where the applications are going to be. So where the applications are, and it's who is going to be the king of applications will actually win this race. So question, in terms of, of migration, you know, we're hearing a lot about mass migration. Amazon's even doing partner competency programs for, for migration. 
not to trivialize it, talk to us about some of the challenges that you're helping customers overcome when they sort of don't know where to start when it comes to that well, data problem. If it's batch data, if it's stuff that I'm only going to touch, if it's an archive that I'm only going to touch you know, once in a blue moon, then I can put it into Snowball and I can ship my Snowball device, I can sort of press the pause button akin to when I'm copying files into a network drive where you can't edit them. Um, and then wait for you know two months, three months, and wait, wait for them to turn up in in AWS, and that's that's fine. If it's transactional data, where maybe 80% of my data set changes on a daily basis, and I've got petabyte scale data to move, that's a hard problem. That requires active transactional data migration. That's a big mouthful, but that's really important for runtime transactional data. That's the problem that we solve. We enable customers without interruption to service to move at massive scale active transactional data into cloud without any interruption to service. So I can still, I can still use it while it's moving. So one of the things we were talking about before you came on was the whole global economy situation. Um, I think a year and a half ago or two years ago, you predicted the housing bubble bursting in London. Okay, you're in the London Exchange, your public company, Brexit, EU. Um, these are huge issues that are going to impact, certainly North America looking healthy right now, but some are saying that this is a big challenge and certainly the uncertainty of the U.S. presidency uh, candidates that are lack of thereof, um, the, general, the general sentiment in the U.S. We're in a world of turmoil. So specifically, the Brexit situation, yeah. you guys are in London, what does this impact your business and is that going to happen? <laughs> or give us some color and insight into what the country men are thinking over there. Okay, so um, I get asked by, I live here of course, and I've lived here for 19 years. It feels like I'm recolonizing sometimes, I have to say. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, I get asked by a lot of Americans what the situation is with Brexit and why it happened. And f for that, you have to look at economics. And if you sort of take a step back, in Northern Europe, nine of the 10 poorest parts of Northern Europe are in the UK. And one, only one of the top 10 richest parts is in the UK, and that's London. So basically, outside of London, the UK is, has a big, really big problem. Those people are dissatisfied. When people get dissatisfied, if they're not benefiting from an economic upturn, if there is, um, you know, if, if governments make it like the Conservative government for the past four years made huge cuts, those people don't benefit, and they, they really feel pissed off, and they, they will vote against the government. So a protest vote, pretty so much? Brexit was really, I think, a, a protest vote. It's people dissatisfied, it's people voting basically anti-immigration, which is, you know, being in the US is a real foreign thing to us. Um, but there are some implications to business. I mean, obviously, you know, there's filings, there's legal issues, obviously currency. Have you been impacted positively, negatively, and what is the outlook on when Disco's business going forward with the Brexit uncertainty and or impact? So we're in great shape because we buy pounds. So we buy labor that's now discounted by 20% in the, in the UK, I just got back from, from the UK. You know, if, if you want to go on vacation, Americans anywhere, go to London this summer and go shopping because everything is humongously discounted for us Americans right now. It's, um, it's, it's a great time to be there. So from a Wan Disco perspective, And how impact the housing bubble too? Oh, oh well, <clears throat> I said to you about a year ago that the London housing market was akin to the jewelry shops that existed in Hong Kong a few years ago where the Chinese used to come over and basically launder money by buying huge diamonds and bars of gold and things. If you look at the London housing market, it is primarily fueled by the Saudis and by the Russians who have been buying, you know, Hyde Park Corner, 100 million pounds, 160 million dollars, well, 140 million dollars now, uh, apartments and so on in, in, in London. Now seven, and I repeat, seven housing funds in the UK last week canceled redemptions, which means that they can foresee liquidity problems coming in those funds. I think you're about to see a housing crash in London, the like of which we've never seen before. And I've, uh, I think it would be very sad. And I think that will make people really question the Brexit decision. So sell London property now, people. Yes. And, and go shopping. I, I heard the go shopping. <laughs> so following to along that, you talked about the significant differential between London and the rest of the UK. You're from Sheffield, you're very proud of that. You've also been very proud of your business really helping to fuel that economy. How do you think Brexit is going to affect Wan Disco in your home, your home area of Sheffield? It, I, I don't think it really will. I think, I think our, our employees there are, 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 are relative terms very well paid. They're working on interesting things. They're working very closely with the AWS team, for example, the S3 team, the EMR team. 
I'm building our technology. We're liaising very closely with them. They're doing lots of interesting things. Um, I suspect their vacations into Europe and their vacations to the United States have just gone up by about 20%, which uh, will reduce the amount of beer that they can drink. It's a big beer drinking part of the world in Sheffield. But, but no, it's, Sheffield is a, uh, in terms of cost of living, is relatively low compared to the rest of the UK, and, and I think those people are pretty, will be pretty happy. David, I really appreciate you coming on theCUBE. I want to um, give you the final word here on the segment because you know, you're a chief executive officer of, your, of a public company. You've been in the industry for a while. You've seen the trials and tribulation of the Hadoop ecosystem now basically being branded as the data ecosystem as Hortonworks has recently announced. Hadoop Summit is now being called DataWorks Summit. They're moving from the word Hadoop to data. Clearly that's impacting all the trends. Cloud data, mobile um, is really the key. I want you, I'm sure you get this question a lot. I would like to take a, you to take a minute and explain to the audience that's watching, what's this phenom of Amazon Web Services really all about? What's all the hubbub about? Why is everyone you know, fawning over Amazon now when you go back five years ago or 10 years ago when it started, you know, they were ridiculed. I mean, and, you know, I remember when they started, I loved it, but they were looked at it as just kind of a tinkering environment. Now they're the behemoth and just on an unstoppable run. Uh, and certainly the expansion has been, you know, fantastic under Andy Jassy's leadership. How do you explain it to normal people what's going on at Amazon? Take a minute, please. So, Amazon is, and that's a brilliant question, by the way. A a Amazon is the best investor relations story ever. And I mean ever. What Bezos did is never talked about the potential size of the market, never talked about this thing was going to generate lots of cash. He just said, you know what, we're building this little internet thing. It might, it might not work. It's not going to make any money. And then in the blink of an eye, it's a $15 billion revenue business growing faster than any other part of his business and throwing off cash like there's no tomorrow. It is just... Uh, the most non-obvious story in, in technology, in business, of any public company ever. I mean, AWS arguably, as a standalone entity, is almost worth as much as Oracle. An unbelievable, an unbelievable story. And to do that with all the complexity, I mean, running a public company with shareholder expectations, with investor relations where you have to constantly um, be positive about what's going on, for him to do that and never talk about making a profit, never talk about this becoming a multi-billion dollar segment of their business is the most So they've been living thing. the agile, certainly that's the business story, yep. but they've been living the agile story relative to announcing a slew of new products, basic building blocks, S3, EC2 to start with, as the story goes from Andy Jassy himself, and then a slew of new services. It's a tsunami of every event of new services. What is the, the disruptive enabler? What's the disruption under the hood for Amazon? How do you explain that? Well, I mean, what they did is they took a really simple concept. They said, okay, storage. How do we make storage completely elastic, completely public, in a way that we can use the public internet to get data in and out of it, right? That's a, that's a sound simple. What they actually built underneath the covers was an extremely complex thing called object store. Everybody else in the industry completely missed this. Oracle missed it, Microsoft missed it, everybody missed it. Now we're all playing catch up trying to develop this thing called Object Store. It's going to take over. I mean, somebody said to me, what's the relevance of, of Hadoop in cloud? And you have to ask that question. You have to, it, it's a relevant question. Do you really need it when you've got Object Store? Sh show me side by side Object Store versus every, you know, NetApp or Teradata or any of those guys. Show me side by side the difference between the two things. There ain't a lot. Amazon Web Services is a company that can put incumbents out of business. David, thanks so much. As we always say, what inning are we in? We think it's really a double header. Game one swept by Amazon Web Services. Game two is the enterprise, and that's really the story here at Amazon Web Services Summit in Silicon Valley. Can Amazon capture the enterprise? Their focus is clear. We're theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Lisa Martin. We'll be right back with more after this short break. <laughs>